my hero? Am I a hero? We're here to challenge your definition of a hero. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the seventh episode of 10,000 Heroes podcast. This is the part of the intro where I usually say what we're doing in this podcast, what we're up to and what it means. But I'm starting to find out that this is as much a process of discovery for me and Encore as it is for our listeners. And um, the wisdom that's been coming out of some of these interviews, Encore, I've been finding ways to apply them immediately. And I, I know you are expressing a little bit of concern with this with this episode today. If there was enough concrete, actionable wisdom that someone could apply in their life. And I absolutely think that's the case. I think the mode of conflict resolution that you and Ken discuss is fundamental uh, for our relationships, for our society, and ultimately for ourselves. And that was something that I was interested to see if you guys were going to explore. You didn't, but I'm interested to know, like, did you have any thoughts about that? How can we apply this internally, this, this conflict resolution? Oh, yeah, of course. And you know, it was such a huge honor and opportunity to have to have Ken Ken Cloak on the show. And I really, I couldn't help feeling every few minutes that I was just blowing it, that I had, I had this like <laughs> dream opportunity and I wasn't asking the right questions. And I, I had, you know, hours more of questions and I had to cut myself off just out of respect for his time and the length of the show. So that was one of the things we didn't get to is how do you apply the model of conflict resolution internally? But I think everything everything he stated just applies, you know, the, yeah. fo the four step model of, of conflict, I think when you know, when the listeners hear it, you can just see both parties as as yourself, you know, the, the different aspects of yourself, and apply, apply all the steps. And yeah, maybe that's something I just invite invite the listeners to try it out on yourselves when you're having an internal conflict and send us an email, you know, let us know how it goes. Yeah, really cool. Okay. Um... I have so much more to ask you. Maybe we'll talk about it after, but let's let's jump in. I'm I'm excited. Fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us, Ken. I'm really excited to have you on the show. And you know, I just like to start. You know, maybe some of our listeners know, but maybe they don't. That your career has been in in mediation. But one one thing I really loved, and I'll see if I'm going to quote a little bit from your website. You know, there's this page on your website where it's the longer bio and there's all of this, you know, beautiful, very official and erudite text about you as a coach, a trainer, consultant, author, speaker, university professor, attorney, arbitrator, judge, education. You have all of these degrees. And then at the end of all that, there's this quote from Kabir, which is in your veins and in mine, there is only one blood the same life that animates us all. Since one unique mother begat us all, where did we learn to f divide ourselves? Yes. And I, I, <laughs> I just love the juxtaposition. <laughs> Very good, yes. Well, none of the um, academic um, uh, sort of uh, professional qualifications tell you anything about someone's heart. Uh, and the title of your show uh, is really about heart. Um, and it turns out that we are given a series of uh, ways of processing information uh, and we develop skills in each of those ways. Uh, so we can process information physically um, by using our bodies to explore the world. Uh, we can also use our minds to explore in different ways. Um, we can explore the world emotionally, but there's also a kind of uh, heart exploration. Uh, and that's one that Kabir and Rumi and um, uh, a number of really absolutely gorgeous poetic um, uh, uh, kind of uh, and inspiring uh, individuals have shown us um, it is really the deepest way into oneself and into others. Wow. So 
what i mean this is not what i expected you to start off with as this you know world famous mediator so what does that have to do with mediation uh it turns out that if you think about um uh this in a in a particular way um uh you can see some really interesting things taking place beneath the surface mediation is basically something that we do in the presence of conflict in order to reduce the conflict, uh, to calm it, um, fundamentally to unravel it, uh, and then to prevent it. So the question then becomes, where is conflict located? And we can see that it's located in each of those spaces. If you ask yourself, um, uh, what happens inside of you when you are in conflict? The very first thing that happens is that you tighten up um, and then, you, yeah. yeah, physically, you begin to tighten up. Um, your brain uh, begins to move into fight or flight mode. Yeah, my my perceptions are constrained, right? I don't notice as much. Uh, well, they're constrained, and at the same time, they're amplified. Okay. Uh, so um, you, uh, uh, in order to be able to do this, you have to simplify information, mm -hmm. which means stereotyping people. Um, and uh, it allows you to think fast, uh, to use Daniel Kahneman's phrase for this, mm -hmm. which means to just respond very, very rapidly uh, in order to get yourself out of a situation. But meanwhile, what is happening is that you are paying attention to rapid movement, um, but not to anything that is still. Um, but another piece of what happens to us is that we begin to shut down our hearts, our capacity for caring, for love, for affection, for connection, for intimacy, for relationship. And it turns out that that is the very last part of us that opens up again. So if we think of whether the outcomes of conflict resolution, first, they're stopping the fighting. That's pretty simple. Second, it is settling the issues. Uh, but that also can be done relatively simply. Third is resolving the underlying emotional issues that gave rise to the conflict and will continue to generate new conflicts until it's resolved. That's much more difficult. Fourth is what you could think of as a kind of spiritual level, which is um, uh, uh, the what we call forgiveness, but what actually consists of letting go of the memory of what happened to you, or transforming it, shifting it in a different direction. And the very last thing that we do in conflict is to open our hearts again to the people who have hurt us. Okay, so in that in that chronology of those five steps, there's one that I, I was totally lost on, which is which is the fourth one. This, yeah. this idea of of letting go of the of the memory of what happened. I wonder if you could go into a little more detail on that. Sure. So, um, if you uh, once again, if you imagine people who are in conflict with each other, the first thing that we have to do is stop them fighting with each other, mm -hmm. and we can do that by separating them. And the second thing we have to do is to figure out what happened, what's wrong, what the issues are, and try to come up with some solutions. Uh, and then we have to recognize that there are um, underlying emotional experiences that people have had that um, uh, are independent of the issues. So if you have two kids who are fighting over who gets to have the bigger piece of cake, um, that can be about the cake, but more likely it's about the relationship between those two kids and how they feel about each other. Which so, will cause them to fight about many other things besides the cake. Yeah. And so if you stop the fighting and settle the issues and resolve the underlying emotional issues, are you done yet? And the answer is you're not done because there is still the memory of what happened to you. Hmm. And that will have a continuing emotional impact, but it'll impact you on multiple levels. And so what we have to do is we have to figure out how do we process this information? And the difficulty is that um, there are various ways of um, returning uh, 
uh, to conflict, of having conflict turn again in a circle, creating a cycle uh, that just reiterates and reiterates itself. And the source of this is out of this sense of shame and humiliation uh, and the sense of having lost, the sense of um, wanting to rectify um, what happened in the past. The difficulty, of course, is that it is past. And so now the question becomes, what do you do with something that is already his, in a part of history? Um, and it turns out that there are several things that you can do with it. Um, and uh, the first of those is simply um, to recognize that you are stuck in something that's over and you are dedicating a part of your life energy to something that has no future whatsoever. Hmm. And that is really a kind of spiritual realization because what, it, what forgiveness consists of um, is not saying, I will allow you to do whatever you want to me. Instead, it, what it consists of is reclaiming your own life energy and um, allowing it to be used in the present and for the future and not be caught up in something that is past and that is over. This, is that similar to what kind of the work, the work of Byron Katie? Yes, Byron, I know Byron and, and we are, our work is very, very similar. Uh, but a lot of her work is exactly in this area, um, trying to figure out a part, one of her very special interventions is to ask the question, um, uh, if you are right about what you say, uh, who have you become? And the difficulty with that is that you, if, if you're right about somebody who's treated you wrong, you become a victim. Mm. Uh, someone who's been wronged um, or if you were aggressive about it you become an aggressor mm. whatever it may happen to be yeah and so the, the other thing that brings to mind you know I, when, when you're giving kind of this overall theory of, of conflict I have two narratives in my mind one is like me having a fight with my wife over breakfast yeah and the other is you know having lived in conflict zones like Liberia and Beirut, you know, I, I, things like that. And I'm imagining what you're saying is meant to apply to both. Yes. Yeah. Uh, they operate on different scales, but human beings are essentially the same in how we process information. Um, there are different techniques that you would use in Liberia, where I've also uh, been a part of a lot of the conflict resolution work that has been done there, um, less so in Beirut. Um, but the, the fundamental uh, questions that you would ask people um, about what happened and how it happened, the, the effort um, to um, create a sense of the other within the self mm. using empathy so that you can no longer simply dismiss the other person um, or discount them or uh, in the extreme form, murder them. Yeah. Um, because this is now something that is inside of you. It's something that you understand. It's a human quality. Uh, and that's the heart piece. Yeah. So on, on the larger, you know, I'm thinking of Liberia or South Africa, where they had this, I forget the name in Liberia, but in South Africa, it was called Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Yes. Um, is that what that looks like on the, on the national level, this process yes. you're talking about? Yes, uh, here is an example of a simple five-step forgiveness process that can be, uh, you can think of as kind of scale-free, meaning it can be a, um, work on a small scale or on a very large scale. Uh, step one, uh, remember what happened and how it felt. Hmm. Uh, it's not forgive and forget, because if you forget, implicitly you give permission for it to happen again. Right. That's the truth telling part of it. So we have to tell the truth about what has happened. Second, on an individual level, imagine as vividly as you can what must have happened to the other person and how they must have felt. Why? Because the first casualty in every conflict is empathy. 
and second is trust. So in order to rebuild trust, we have to rebuild empathy. And that is what is really involved in trying to imagine inside yourself what it might feel like to be uh, someone who's experienced this on the other side. The third step is to identify um, counterintuitively all of the reasons you can think of for not forgiving them. Hmm. And all of the expectations you had of them that they did not meet. Why? Because there's a reason why you haven't forgiven them. And we have to confront that reason. And it's not about denying the truth of what they did. Um, it's about actually coming into full acceptance um, of that truth. And then um, trying to shift the process in the direction of problem solving. And, right. and, and then the fourth element is to identify, um, uh, well, actually it's in two parts. First, let go of all of those reasons, as many as you can. And if you can't, number two, uh, step part two of, of this fourth part, um, is to identify what it's gonna cost you to hold on to them. Hmm. And what it's gonna cost you is your life. And then five, um, create some um, ritual, design and execute a ritual uh, of release, completion and closure. Uh, and that's what the reconciliation piece is about. Opening your heart again to the other side, to people who have done this to you. Um, and that is not easy. That's really tough. Yeah. Um, many years ago, I started an organization called Mediators Beyond Borders. Uh, and we worked with the uh, child soldiers in the Buddha Durham refugee camp. Uh, and there were child soldiers from Liberia. Uh, and then we went back into Liberia and helped organize some of the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions that took place there, um, modeled on the South Africa model, but with diff some differences for the Liberian situation. But these are in the communities that these child soldiers had ravaged. Um, where they had raped and pillaged and murdered. And now you've got the people who, whose relatives have died who are in there, uh, in, they're in the same room with you. What do you say? What kind of conversation can you have with each other? And it's incredibly powerful and incredibly dramatic. So that, but it follows this basic idea. Um, and there is a sixth element of this as well, which is prevention. Hmm. Just looking at the systems that have generated conflict. Um, so, for example, your conflict with your wife may be an individual conflict, but it may also be about the marital system. Mm -hmm. um, and that system can be um, um, how cleanly, uh, how much does cleanliness matter in the kitchen? Or... Um, uh, are we on time or are we late? Or how do we spend money? Or any number of different things like that. But those can be systems uh, as well as just individual preferences. Sure, sure. So, I mean, I think this is going to happen over and over, but I just keep, I need to go back. Um, yeah, <laughs> because sure. there's, there's just so much great, great density. Um, it, it, so it seems like once we totally you know, bring all like the accusation audit that you're talking about, you know, bring everything to the forefront. Then we have the opportunity to decide, do I want to be a prisoner of the past? Is that, is that kind of the yes, key moment exactly there? Exactly right. Exactly right. So every conflict puts a little, places a little hook inside of us that allows the other person to reel us in. And our job is to remove that hook. Hmm. But the secret of it is, um, that hook is located in a place where there is conflict inside of us. So every conflict can be thought of as existing in three locations. One, inside of us. Two, relationally, between us. And three, systemically, in the environment, in the conditions, in the cultures, in the circumstances in which we live. So poverty is an example of a economic system that generates chronic conflicts. Anybody who's poor doesn't like it and they want to get out of that trap. Hmm. And what are the ways out? And a lot of those involve conflict. 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That okay. That all makes sense. I'm so I want to um. Again, I want to maybe jump jump back a little bit, kind of alternate between the the power of these experiences with something more specific to you. So you know, you've talked. You started out talking about heart and all of this work, even the very analytical work that you're talking about, is really rooted. You know, the ultimate goal of it is reopening the heart. When you when you went down this path of of law and mediation and conflict, is that did you know that from the beginning, or did you discover that? kind of empirically through your work? Um, I would say that both are true uh, and neither is true. Uh, in other words, uh, I may have somehow known it inside myself, but I didn't know that I knew it. Mm. Um, and I did discover it through the work because um, in every conflict, particularly I would say in marital conflicts, um, there is uh, a an element of desire, uh, desire for connection with the other person, um, uh, desire for uh, things to be going smoothly, for enjoyment, for the pleasure of being together. Um, and conflict stands in the way of that. Uh, and so the question then becomes, what is it that really prevents us from getting there? Um, what stops us from uh, just dropping all of the petty little things that we fight about and just being together. Yeah. And there are two answers, I think, at least to that. Uh, one is um, that it isn't the petty things, it's the meaning of the petty things. So we assign a meaning to the small little stuff that happens. It equals disrespect or it equals you don't care for me or whatever it may equal. Uh, and then the second part of it is um, uh, that we defend ourselves against um, heart conversations because they're so important to us. So the reason why we can't resolve our disputes is because we want to so badly, hmm. because it means so much to us, because we care so deeply. Like we're, we're afraid that if we try to resolve it and fail, like what the consequences would be. Yes, exactly right. God. Exactly right. Can you, can you tell me a little bit about the context in which you, you learned that during your work? Like, was it, was it in a kind of marital conflict mediation session or was it in Liberia or, you know? Uh, all of the above. <laughs> mm. um, the, yeah, the, I have been working in other countries for um, uh, almost as long as I've been mediating. Um, I've been mediating now for 40 years, uh, and I have mediated really thousands and thousands and thousands of disputes, um, including international ones, cross-cultural ones, and I've worked in 20 different countries, 25 different countries, really. Um, and what you discover in the course of doing all of this is um, uh, what the commonalities are. Uh, what are the things that people share across cultures? What makes us human? Um, what's underneath a lot of this? Um, is because the superficial stuff, you can resolve pretty quickly. Uh, if it's just a, a simple misunderstanding, that's relatively simple. The hard stuff comes when people uh, both care deeply and in opposite ways about the same things. Mm -hmm. uh, divorcing couples. Uh, so I would say a big part of what I learned, I learned from divorcing couples. Um, people who once cared about each other and then what happened to that caring. And I've also learned it by watching people who, were, who didn't care at all about each other and then all of a sudden discovered that they did. Um, uh, a... Uh, conversation in Zimbabwe between supporters of uh, Robert Mugabe and supporters of Morgan Svangarai, who was at that time uh, running for president, um, kids shooting into each other's homes um, and then discovering that their parents were actually in the homes that they were shooting at and bringing people into conversation with each other, um, uh, Catholics and Protestants in Northern Ireland um, Azerbaijanis and Armenians even, um, and um, 
uh, Sandinistas and Contras in Nicaragua, um, and then seeing what happens in those conversations and incredibly how incredibly powerful they are. When you ask people the right questions, the questions that invite them to bring their own human nature out into the open and not defend themselves and create these ba uh, 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 barricades um, between them, uh, then what happens is really magic. Hmm. And so would you say that's one of the kind of the essential skills of the mediator is knowing it's, it's about questions, knowing what to ask, yeah. when to ask, how to ask? Yes. Uh, I teach a course, um, a, a short little course called The Art of Asking Questions. And uh, it's actually quite powerful and amazing. Um, the truth in every conflict is that you are my question and I am yours. And now how do we ask a question that allows people to see that that is the case? So for example, um, I organized, uh, well, I helped uh, brought together a group of people to train Greek mediators in how to conduct dialogues between Greek citizens and immigrants. And this is a hot topic in Greece. Here are the opening two questions. Question one, to each person, um, have you ever in your life, in a family or a neighborhood or a school or a workplace, been the new one and everybody else has been there for a long time? What did it feel like to come into an environment where everybody was already functioning and you were the one who was you know, coming in new? Um, and then question two, have you ever been in your life in a family or neighborhood or school or workplace, uh, been the one who's been there for a while and now new people are coming in and they're disrupting everything and changing everything? And how did that feel? What happened? And now in two questions, everybody can start to imagine what it might feel like to be an immigrant or a Greek citizen. And now we can start the real conversation because we've begun with the ability to appreciate that these are not some, you know, sort of subhuman people that we have, you know, kind of, that we can safely ignore and even kill uh, because we haven't uh, had the courage to imagine them alive to really treat them as though they were um, no different from us. So those are the kinds of things that are really magical. Uh, wow, that's that's beautiful. Um, okay, so I'm gonna go in this direction that I had totally not not planned on. <laughs> can, all right, this is, it's a two part question. Part one, can you give me those same questions, you know, the analog of those questions for Black Lives Matter? Sure, absolutely. Um, I wrote a book uh, that I published a year and a half ago, two years ago, uh, called Politics, Dialogue, and the Evolution of Democracy. And one of the chapters in it is about um, how to design dialogues over race, uh, prejudice uh, of all kinds. So the difficulty is that um, we have to start with an assumption. Um, and I come to this assumption really out of my experience in the 1960s working in the civil rights movement in the South, um, working directly with highly, deeply prejudiced people, uh, but, and also working within the black community uh, in the South, and then working also in the North. Um, and the fundamental idea is that um, uh, uh, the, the primary source of prejudice uh, is a fear of loss of status, wealth, power. Um, and therefore what we have to try to create is some sense of commonality between people. Um, but in order to do this, we also have to have some understanding of what it feels like so here are a couple of questions that allows, allow people to do this. Um, and I will do this, for example, in groups of people where there's mixed groups and I'll try to, I'll, here's the assignment. Find somebody who's as different as you possibly can from yourself in this group. 
If you're male, feel, find someone who's female. Uh, if you're black, find somebody who's white or Latino or Asian or whatever. Now sit down together, the two of you, and each of you tell a story about some time in your life when you felt um, prejudiced against, uh, stereotyped, not seen for who you actually were. And it can be a name that you were called in elementary school. Um, it can be the way that other kids treated you. Uh, it can be the way that people treat you now, whatever it may happen to be. Tell a story about that and what it felt like. And what happens then is people begin to realize it feels the same. Um, but now as a white male, I can find inside of me what it might feel like to have experienced this every day for 30 years. Uh, and now I'm going to be a little bit more open to wondering what this might feel like to somebody else. Um, here's another one. Um, uh, ask people, put people into different groups and ask them like a, a, a group of men and a group of women. Um, ask them to, do, to prepare a presentation on what it was like to grow up as a member of your group to the other group, what you most want them to know about what it felt like to grow up as a member of your group. And then add in all of the things that you never ever want to hear or experience again. And then invite them to ask the questions that they always wanted to ask members of your group, but were afraid to ask. Um, here's the, so that's another type of process. Um, here's another one. What are the stories that people tell about your group? What kinds of stories do they tell? What stories do you tell about them? And now let's look at those stories. Um, and we can think of the stories uh, not just as um, statements of something that happened, but as narratives, as characterizations of an entire group. So what is the request that's hidden in the story? What are they asking through the story for you to do differently? Hmm. And what are some things that you could do to make sure that nobody ever told that story about you again? Things like that. Uh, there, uh, and there are hundreds of those kinds of questions that can be asked. Um, here's a question that I uh, you know, sort of came up with uh, relatively recently because we were working with a group of people who were dealing with uh, prejudice um, and there was a lot of defensiveness on the part of the people who were being accused of being prejudiced. Sure. And so the question to them was, um, do you feel that as somebody who's been prejudiced, that, that is being accused of being prejudiced, that you are being stereotyped? And that just stopped them. And they said, yes, absolutely. We feel stereotyped. Well, now they can begin to understand what it might feel like to feel stereotyped in the other direction. Mm -hmm. So let's take a look at stereotypes. How are they created? Um, and try to understand them together. Those are a few of the things. There's a lot more that can be said about this. Yeah, no, I really liked, especially that last one, because one of the things that struck me about the example with um, the immigrants in Greece is that both people really had an opportunity to be put in the in the other person's shoes. You know, what's it like to be an immigrant? What's it like to have immigrants come in? You know, when you asked that that first question in response to the Black Lives Matter question was was something like, all right, what is it? What does it feel like to be prejudiced against, you know? But I, I really wanted to hear the other part of like, tell the story of what it feels like to be prejudiced. Oh, yes, yes. And have everyone okay. have the opportunity to share that. That I think that comes first. Okay. Um, actually, that, the, the, the very first thing that has to happen is that we have to recognize um, that uh, uh, there are, um, that, that the two different forms of prejudice are experienced very, very differently. Um, and uh, the goal of asking that second question is to enable people to hear, to the, ans hear the answer to the first question. Um, but the first question has to be, um, you know, can you talk about uh, what it has been like growing up as a member of your group? 
Mm. And doing this when we when we we do the presentations, um, the African American group goes first, or the women's group goes first, uh, and then the other group goes second. Um, and at the same time, what we want to see is that stereotyping is alive and well in every conflict. Yeah. We stereotype our opponent. So what we want to do is to figure out what is it about conflict that causes us to stereotype? What are the sources of stereotype, not just in conflict, but how are those two connected? But it, uh, it, it, seem, it seems to me that if I did not stereotype my opponent, or I, if I did not have this, um, even this linguistic difference, you know, between me and my opponent or me and the enemy, then I couldn't really engage in conflict. Yeah. It seems like it's necessary for me to dehumanize them, whether it's like my wife or the guy in the street with the hat or whatever, just so I can have those emotions of, of anger and, and reaction and everything I have. I, I wouldn't be able to do that if I didn't dehumanize them. Yes, exactly. And then the question uh, that we need to ask is, what are you getting from that reaction that you need? In other words, why is it so important to you to be able to have that reaction? And um, the answer is, I think, uh, that there is information that is contained within that emotion that needs to be acknowledged and addressed. The problem is the emotion itself doesn't tell you what that information is. It leads you in its direction, but it doesn't actually give you the information. Um, and that is where the heart piece comes in, because the reason why we want to express our anger to this person is because we feel put down, because we feel badly treated. So if someone insults you, the first response you're likely to have is to insult them right back. And then the question is why? And the answer is because you're trying to teach them what it feels like to be insulted so that they will understand what it feels like, have some empathy with you, and decide not to treat you that way in the future. Hmm. Well, that's kind of a complex way of dealing with it. But in order to say that, you have to be willing to become vulnerable and open your heart in the presence of somebody who's just hurt you. And um, instead of doing that, and using words which might not be effective. Let's give you a real experience of what it feels like to be treated the way you just treated me. And the assumption is you'll learn from that, but of course, <laughs> totally, totally fake. doesn't happen. Yeah, I mean, that'd be, that'd be in some ways, that'd be great, right? If we, if we yeah. learned, if we had like a spiritual <laughs> growth moment every time we were insulted. But, um, yeah, no, I haven't had that experience. Um, all right, peace in the Middle East. Yeah. What, um, what needs to happen? Uh, well, some of the things are already happening, uh, but they're happening on a relatively small scale and they're not significant enough. The difficulty, of course, is that here we have this um, problem of forgiveness. Um, there's a, a very powerful statement that was made many years ago by Golda Meir. Um, who said, uh, we can forgive the Palestinians for killing our children, but we will never forgive them for forcing us to kill theirs. Wow. Okay, so that's about a sense of mutual guilt and shame and uh, all of the pain that is associated with that and the um, uh, alienation uh, from each other. All of those are really difficult issues. The things that are happening that I think are very powerful, uh, first is there's a group that I've been working with uh, called uh, Combatants for Peace. And these are former soldiers for both sides. Wow. Former soldiers for the Israeli Defense Force, for Hamas, for Fatah, etc. And these people have gotten together and said, this just doesn't work. And nobody can question their courage or sacrifice or any of that. So these people have a lot to say, and they are a very powerful group, but they are still very, very small. And there are other groups that are like this. 
uh, there was a group that I was working with consisting mostly of women, um, Israeli, um, and, but including Muslim and Jewish women. And they would go into small towns, villages, and they would set up card tables in the center of town. Muslims on one side, Jews on the other. And they would start to talk honestly about what it is. What's it all about? You know, what is Islam? What is Judaism? And having these conversations right in the center of town and people start gathering around and listening and wanting to participate and they bring up chairs and pretty soon they've got a dialogue going. That's another really powerful way of dealing with it um, that operates at a, a more of a human level. Um, uh, the, uh, the difficulty is that um, there is one little piece of this that is really uh, almost impossible to resolve, which is there is a, a piece of land that is claimed by both sides. Um, this sets up what is called a zero sum game, meaning it's automatically win lose. Yeah. So as soon as you slipped into win lose, uh, then the only question is who's, who's gonna win and who's gonna lose. Yeah. So what we have to do is to figure out how to, um, uh, what we call expand the pie, uh, meaning how to add some more things to the equation, how to build um, collaboration along issues that matter. For example, there's the Jordan River um, that runs through um, multiple countries and um, it's drying up. There's climate change, which is impacting everybody. There are areas in the Middle East that are actually in the summer unlivable because of the heat. Mm. Um, and those are increasing uh, in severity. Um, there are issues of pollution. I mean, all kinds of issues. There's the, uh, the problem of the COVID vaccine, um, the availability of healthcare. There are ways in which it is possible to uh, create connections, which doesn't mean that everybody agrees or joins the same religion, but it does mean that you don't shoot each other. Uh, and those are the things I think that need to be strengthened, that those social connections. Um, and I think we're still a long way away from even truth and reconciliation. Mm -hmm. But somehow there has to be um, and, and or even a willingness to engage in dialogue, um, even that willingness is not present. And if you mention the word mediation um, in the Middle East, everybody poo poos it because mm -hmm. they had a lot of experience with mediations that have failed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, what you bring up about the zero sum game, I mean, it's so it's so powerful. I I taught you know english it's you know in 2003 at a at shatila you know the refugee camp oh you did wow and you know met so many people and they, they would have like the maps to their family's orange orchard and the key around their next to their house and you know i did the math in my head i was like they were never at that house you know it's like it's like a family heirloom but they know in their mind they know exactly how to get there and they have the same key that it opened the door wow so the idea that, you know, we're so used to this digital world of like fungible assets, but for, for those people, they're so attached to, you know, this actual, I mean, it's a, it's a very small zero sum game. It's like this one hectare or five hectares of land. I could see it being uh, very challenging for, for them and for whoever's living there now to be like, no, I'm not going to take five hectares of land down, even down the street or in the next river valley or anywhere. Right. Yeah. Uh, the, the difficulty is that you, um, uh, it's fundamentally a losing proposition to take people's land away from them. Um, and as soon as you have done that, you have already set in motion um, something that will last really for centuries, yeah. as we've seen in the United States with Native yeah. uh, communities, in Canada with First Nation. One of the countries that's done probably better than most of the others, although not perfect, but certainly better than most of the others is New Zealand, which has actually returned huge tracts of land to the Maori uh, community that were taken from them, uh, including prime tracts of land. Um, and 
there are multiple efforts taking place to try to uh, build collaboration and cooperation between those communities. Um, but the, uh, uh, the difficulty is that as long as we have created a kind of global economic system in which um, property is a source of wealth um, and security and identity, then the question becomes um, who has access to those things and who doesn't. And the trick is then to try to redefine those things in ways that don't depend on um, one person winning and the other person losing. Yeah. That's not an easy thing to do. Yeah. So it's not going to be simple to solve it. And at the same time, we can all project forward and imagine that this is really unstable. You can't keep this up. Something disastrous is going to happen. Yeah, certainly. All right. So let's 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 take that. So either the case in the Middle East or the case, let's say, with the Black Lives Matter in the US, what what if we had the political will where we, we had someone in the leadership who was like, oh. This cannot go on. Every this is just creating more and more suffering. It's only going to get worse. And they're like, I'm going to dedicate a bunch of resources, you know, trained people, money, institutions, infrastructure, to to like really resolving this. How sh how should that program be architected? Like, what's the way to s scale mm -hmm. up? Or, yeah. Well, I think there are kind of two answers to this. Uh, one answer is a kind of simple uh, answer. Um, it's one that um, uh, is easily expressible just in a word, uh, and the word is sharing. Uh, what we're talking about sharing is status, wealth, and power. And um, the, um, then the question becomes, how exactly do we do this? Um, we share status by uh, making sure that at the Oscars, uh, there are uh, women and African Americans in all categories and other Latinos and Asians, etc., who have equal uh, ability to demonstrate their talent and their skill and be recognized for doing that. Um, that we share the economic wealth. Um, and what that means is um, making sure that jobs are available, um, that people have uh, reparations for losses that they have experienced. Um, and we share power by making sure that people can vote. And I think this is what we are actually involved in right now. This is the, the historically um, critical uh, conflict which is taking place in our lives right now, just as it was for me in the 1960s when I became part of, the, the, of that civil rights movement. It's essentially the same issue, but we're much more advanced now. And now the question is, are we really actually going to share this stuff? Or are we going to try to keep it for ourselves? And what's what's the relationship between, you know, the solutions you just talked about, you know, sharing status, wealth and power, and what we were talking about earlier in the show, the the truth and reconciliation process. Is there um yeah. a temporal relationship between those things? Yeah, the, the difficulty is um, how do you stop um, a, a oppressive system from moving forward? Uh, and the difficulty is if you address it only at the level of behavior, you're not going to stop it. And even if you address it only at the level of systems and structures, you aren't necessarily going to stop it either. So if we take a look at prejudice as an illustration, um, we can say fundamentally that there are uh, three manifestations of prejudice. First of all, there are things that you would call racist uh, or sexist or classist or um, anti-Semitic, uh, Islamophobic, you know, all of those various things that you would, you could say, okay, these are specific ways in which people express their hatred for one another. Uh, and push back against one another. And then we can say that beneath those are a set of systems and structures. So there's a book by Isabel Wilkerson called Cast, 
in which he looks at race from the point of view of caste. Um, and the value of this is that it is possible, for example, um, to, uh, for a police department to not be racist, but at the same time to be uh, uh, enforcing a kind of set of caste restrictions, keeping people in their place. Mm -hmm. And the purpose of the systems and the structures is to maintain the hierarchy, the pecking order. Sure. I'm on top, you're below me, somebody else is above me. And my goal is to get as high up in that pecking order as I can. And then the question is, what feeds the pecking order? And the answer is the zero sum game. Mm -hmm. That is the idea that your gain is my loss. Um, and my gain is your loss. And there's only, there's only one seat on top, right? There's one seat on top and that's it. Yeah. But now, for example, if we just ask the members of the people who are listening into your program, um, we can ask them three kinds of questions, three categories of questions. Category of question number one, who is the oldest person on this call? Who's the youngest? Who's the tallest? Who's the shortest? Who lives the closest to downtown Chicago? Who lives the furthest away? And now notice there is a single correct answer for everyone. Hmm. That's the hierarchy. And those answers are arranged in a hierarchy. So from the oldest to the youngest or the youngest to the oldest, whatever it may happen to be. Quest category of question number two, how old are you? How tall are you? Where do you live? Now there's a single correct answer for each person. So we've just shifted out of the hierarchy just by asking a question that resituates the problem in the individual person. Category of question number three, what issues are you facing at whatever age you're at? Hmm. What does your height mean to you? What do you love about where you live? What do you not love about where you live? And now there are multiple correct answers for each person. And isn't that much more interesting? Oh yeah, we've just gone into like inside the question rather than staying exactly. on the surface. Beautifully said, exactly right. Yeah. So that's what we want to do. We want to move inside the question. We want to, in the uh, Rainer Maria Rilke says, uh, we want to live the questions. And then someday we may live along into the answers. Beautiful. Beautiful. Um, okay, change, changing a little bit. I'm, I'm curious. It, it, this is, um, you know, the med meditation has been a big part of my life for the last yeah. 20 years. Me too. Okay. So that, that was kind of my question. Meditation, mediation, I always mistype them. There's one letter apart. Is that, is that just a, you know, a, a coincidence or do you think there's a deeper, there's a deeper connection between those two paths? Oh, I think there's a deeper connection. Definitely. Um, one way is simply to take a look at what the definition is. And of course, uh, media means, uh, or medium, uh, to meet in the middle. Uh, in Buddhism, this is called the middle way, hmm. um, which means not too much, not too little. Um, and the, uh, there's a simple way in which you can do that. Here's, I think, the deeper truth. There are two middle ways, not one. The first middle way is compromise. Uh, you take hot water and add cold water and you get lukewarm water. But the second way is synergy, mm -hmm. which is that you take water, add flour and yeast and heat and make bread. Mm. And the bread has nothing in common, either with the flour or the heat or the water or the yeast superficially. It's a product of the mixture of all of those. So what we're looking at is how do we get to a place where we combine all of the things in our lives together uh, in ways that lead us back into ourselves and through ourselves to others. So meditation, um, I meditate at least an hour every morning um, without exception and have for decades now. And um, I couldn't do the work that I do if it were not for meditation. So it's very, very powerful. Um, I think of it as, um, uh, simply 
um, going to your own ground state, the state of who you actually are, um, of um, letting go of everything that you can conceivably let go of, and then let get, letting go of letting go. Um, so it is um, a, simply for me, the place that you go that has no words. There's no language. Um, it's beneath language, deeper than language, much, much grander than language. It's what language is trying to describe and can't ever, but always uh, has to try. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like asking the question without needing necessarily the answer. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yes, I would encourage uh, everybody to create a meditation practice. All that you're doing is you're just being with yourself. Um, and what that means is, of course, being yourself. Um, but when you do that, what you discover is um, what it is that connects us at a really, really deep level. Uh, and then the differences between us and them begin to disappear. And that, of course, is the real goal of conflict resolution, is to simply recognize that in all the conflicts between us and them, uh, there is no them. It's just us. And as yeah. soon as you have made that shift, everything changes. Now we can start to solve problems without blaming them on each other. Yeah, so the, the, there's a core of this that's really about kind of ra radical responsibility. Is that, a, is that a term that you would use? Yes, absolutely. Radical meaning going to the root. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I think that this is exactly what it is. It's a radical responsibility for ourselves and each other and the planet uh, for all of the things that we do and have done. Uh, and that doesn't mean um, sinking into uh, kind of guilt and shame and mutual blaming or self-blaming or any of those things. Uh, it means stopping it from going forward um, and uh, recognizing that um, either no one is responsible for anything or we are all responsible for everything. Uh, and need to do whatever we can in our lives to make sure that somehow the world is a little bit of a better place uh, for our having lived here. That's the dream. <laughs> yeah, that's the dream. <laughs> that's the dream. So, so maybe that relates and you know, our, you know, the podcast is called 10,000 heroes. And mm -hmm. when I remember, which I don't always remember, but I'd love to ask the, the guests kind of what your definition of a hero is. Ah, well, um, uh, who was it? Uh, Anne Sexton, I think. Um, the, said, the poet. The poet mm -hmm. said, um, sometimes, this is a quote, sometimes it is necessary to be a hero just in order to be an ordinary, decent human being. And there are times when just being an ordinary, decent human being uh, requires you to be a hero. Uh, do you turn in uh, the Jew who's living next door to the Nazi stormtrooper when they come asking? Um, what do you do in that moment? Um, that's a hero. Just saying um, no to that person is heroic. Um, uh, or whatever it is, the, the difficulty is that I think that for all of us, showing up, uh, living our lives is a kind of heroism. Um, and I think that a part of what heroism means is um, a uh, willingness uh, to um, uh, continue doing, being who we are um, and doing what we do in the face of incredible obstacles. Um, so yes, I think everybody just showing up every day uh, is heroic. Um, and there are people, of course, who have a kind of grand heroism 
uh, a really kind of stunning, breathtaking heroism. Um, and in my experience, those are not the people who are the most forefront leaders. Um, they're the ones who you don't notice. Hmm. And I say this having worked in the South and seeing real heroes um, among sharecroppers. Uh, I mean, the willingness to uh, lose one's life for what one believes in. Um, that's a kind of heroism. And what you realize is that in those moments, being heroic is actually not really heroic at all on some level, because it's the other stuff. It's not, it's living out of integrity, not having the courage that's the easiest way to go. Mm. Um, but it's also the most troublesome and the most problematic and the one that causes the most damage. So part of what heroism is, is being true to yourself and thereby being true to others. Um, uh, love is a form of heroism everywhere um, because um, we know that we're going to experience defeat, um, that, we will not be that we will not be understood. We will not be recognized 100% for who we are or appreciated as deeply as we would love to be, or treated as well as we would like. Um, and uh, finding that um, it is possible to take joy in the small things, uh, the teeny tiny things, little moment by moment things that happen every single day. Um, that requires a kind of heroism too. Thank you for that, that beautiful, beautiful reflection. So in preparation for this interview, I read some of your recent newsletters. And I, I remember being very surprised both when I got them, I guess when I first got them, at how overtly political they seemed to me, you know, because my, my knowledge of you from your, from your books is, you know, this, this mediator, you know, the first thing I was surprised about, you know, I, I found your books because I was looking for mediators that would be kind of role models because I wanted to go into mediation. And then I, re I was reading your books and instead of, and there, I mean, there is some like very technical theoretical models and information in there, but a lot of it was very clearly, you know, to me at least spiritual and about the heart and these questions and very personal. And, you know, that boded well for me because that's how I approach things. But I was, I was surprised. I was like, oh, okay. So this career really is about interiors and really is about hearts. Um, and then when I read your newsletters, I was also surprised because they seemed very, very political, where in my mind, the media should be like really um, kind of above, above taking sides. But, but really where I felt like you were, and maybe taking sides is too strong language, but you were really anti-fascism. Anti and you, you have all, all of this recent writing about what it's going to take to maintain democracy in the face of a desire for fascism. So I just want, and you know, when you said common decency a couple of minutes ago, I, I thought of Orwell and, and fascism. And I just wanted to in, invite you if there's anything you'd like to say about this particular moment we're at, sure. fascism, mediation, love. Yeah. Um, um, one of the things that I think uh, is quite striking about mediation around the world is that we have become quite adept at responding to relational conflicts, organizational conflicts, environmental, even public policy conflicts, but we have had almost nothing to say about political conflicts. And yet political conflicts grip us. And so the question then occurred to me, um, how do you, is there a possible way uh, for conflict resolution to have an impact within the uh, uh, arena of politics and political conflict. In other words, to put it differently, what would an interest-based form of politics look like? And so I wrote this book in an effort, a couple of books actually, in an effort to try to find out, see what the answer was. 
Um, and I did it for really two reasons. One was because of my own history as a part of the civil rights movement and the anti-war movement in the United States in an effort to try to figure out what does this one have to do with the other? So for the first part of my adult life, I created conflicts. And now for the second <laughs> time, I'm resolving them, what is this about? Um, and the second part of it was um, to try to rethink this from a more um, systematic kind of point of view. Um, and so what I tried then to do was to redefine politics as an interest-based process. And, and, and then you're, you're making a contrast between rights-based and interest-based, is that right? Uh, Power-based, rights-based, and interest-based. Yeah. Would right. you just di digress a little bit into outlining those sure. for, for the listeners? Sure. So um, uh, let's imagine for a moment that we're all in the same room and that there's an air conditioning unit in the room and half the room wants it on and half the room wants it off. Oh yeah, I've, I've been I've been in that situation totally. Yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> um, so how do we resolve it? Uh, answer one on the basis of power. Uh, whoever has the most power, whoever has the most guns, whoever has the highest title, whoever is the the king or the dictator, they get what they want. Everybody else suffers. So then, what you've got is winners and losers. Mm -hmm. And then, if one group wins all the time and the other group loses all the time you have uh, stereotyping and bias and prejudice and discrimination that occur. And ultimately reprisal and instability. Exactly. Yeah. And therefore, because nobody wants to be a part of that. So of course they're either gonna leave or they're gonna rebel uh, or revolt or whatever it's going to happen to be because nobody wants to be a part of that uh, or unless they are on the winning side. Uh, so then as a result of that, compromises are made and we create a system of resolving disputes based on rights. So how do we deal with the air conditioning unit? Um, let's say we vote all in favor of the air conditioning unit being on. Well, that's win-lose. One side wins and the other side loses. It's the majority versus the minority. And there's, that's more fair than having the dictator say it's going to be on or it's going to be off. So we, people don't, aren't as upset. Uh, if there's a rights-based process. And it or, might lead to stability for a longer period of time. Okay. Exactly right, exactly right. Uh, or you go to court and the judge decides there's a winner and a loser in court. Um, the interest-based approach is to say, why, what are your interests? Why do you want it on? Well, I want it on because it's stuffy in here. Well, how about if we bring in a fan? How about if I open a window? Well, I want it off because we're freezing. Well, what if the people on the one side give the other people their coats? Uh, what if we bring in a space heater? I want it off because it's too noisy and I can't hear. Well, what if I use a microphone or speak louder? In other words, multiple options open up to satisfy interests that do not require a winner and a loser. That's the great advantage of interest-based processes. So instead of organizing things as a hierarchy, going back to those questions that I was asking before, uh, instead, what we do is we see that here's a, an interest-based definition of politics. It is a social problem-solving process. That's all. That's all it is. The whole thing is a social problem-solving process together with hierarchy, a pecking order, domination, superiority. Uh, one side wins and the other side loses. Uh, competition for who's going to be in which category. That's the second part. And the question then becomes, can we eliminate that second part or at least reduce it, confine it um, so that it isn't so predominant? And I think the answer is yes. There's a second definition of interest-based politics, a large group decision-making process. But we now have through conflict resolution experience in large group decision-making processes. We have techniques for building consensus, for overcoming impasse, for reducing resistance. And those techniques work one-on-one -on -one in mediations and also in large group mediations. And they're very powerful and very effective, not 100%, but we don't need 100%. If we even had 50%, it would be revolutionary. And so the 
the goal of the political materials is to say um, that it is possible to shift in the direction of um, what you can think of as substantive democracy rather than procedural democracy. So instead of just voting, we're actually building consensus between people who disagree with one another about how to solve problems. That's what, we're, that's what politics will consist of. And what fascism represents is a retreat to power-based solutions. Mm -hmm. So that's the reason for the critique and the, the goal of the critique is really to strengthen an interest-based approach to political decision-making. So, okay, so I, I'd like to know a little bit more about what that looks like, you know, as, as we try to move from, you know, rights-based to interest-based or substantive democracy, imagine we have like a deep split, you know, if, if it was going to be a vote, it was going to be close to 50-50. Do we, do we still vote on this particular issue or is there some sort of dialogue that happens in the town or the yes. legislative district before the vote or how, how does that integrate it with the current system? That's exactly the way it happens. So uh, we, we can take any number of issues. We can take a deeply divisive, divisive issue like gun control, for example, where Fantastic. people are really Fantastic. divided. Yeah. Yeah. So um, uh, the, on the one hand, you have people who want to get rid of all guns everywhere. And on the other hand, you have people who want all guns to be available to everyone. Yeah. Uh, the overwhelming majority of people want there to be some restrictions on the possession of guns by people who are going out killing people. So the question is, can we reach actually significant levels of consensus around that issue? And I think the answer is absolutely we can. Um, if we present the issue in the right way, not as an either or, but as a conversation, then what can happen is uh, we can actually talk to one another and come up with proposals that are acceptable for both sides. And I say this having done this uh, on really large numbers of issues over the years with lots of different groups of people. Um, it's a consensus building process and we've got people in the US who are experts in this, who do it all the time. It's very, very successfully. So um, what would that be? Well, that would depend on what came out of it. It's all, a part of the dialogue, but it has to begin by um, dismantling our assumptions about the other side as evil. Mm. Um, and instead, sort of trying to understand what it is that's actually going on. Here was a, there, I facilitated a consensus building process not long ago in um, a state in the South where there was a, a dam and a river and the environmentalists wanted to get rid of the dam and only have the river uh, and the uh, uh, commercial you know, folks and the conservatives wanted to keep the dam and get rid of the river. And what happened was we, we just recreated this dialogue between the leadership and the spokespeople on both sides. And there was a kind of magical moment where the, the head of the um, pro-dam and anti-dam groups, the heads of both of those groups were in the same small group. And we, one of the questions we taught the facilitators to ask was, why, what does this mean? To, what, would it, what does the dam mean to you? And one of, the, one of the people said, well, what the dam means to me is, um, you know, when I was little, my dad took me fishing uh, on the dam and we just had a great time and I'd like to take my kids fishing. And the guy who's pro river says, well, that's really interesting because my dad used to take me fishing in the river. And I'd like to take my kids fishing in the river. And it was all of a sudden they just looked at each other and it was like, whoa, we're the same. We just had different experiences and different dads, but we're trying to get the same thing for our kids. And it was really quite beautiful. And they came up with a solution that was to kind of keep both and try to uh, you know, sort of create recreational opportunities for families um, that were larger than what they had thought of before. So it was a real shift in their, in their conversation. It doesn't always happen that way and you can't guarantee success, but what you can do is um, stop people from shooting one another. Uh, and that's a big step forward. Yeah, yeah, 
That's beautiful. Do you have an advice for, you know, someone who's a high school or a college student that wants to go into a, a career in mediation and really make an impact uh, on the world in this way? I would say the most important thing is to find a local community mediation program and volunteer um, to try to create one in your high school uh, or junior high school or elementary school. Um, there are organizations around that will support you um, that have some degree of funding, not nearly enough, uh, but some degree of funding to support these programs. Um, and especially to work, I would say, with um, uh, kids who commit crimes and their victims and in restorative justice programs where you're actually working, trying to create restorative forms of justice. Great. That's really helpful. Well, thank, thank you so much, Ken. I just, before we go here, I just, is there anything you'd like to share or any request you'd like to make or suggestion or anything of our, of our listeners? Well, I would say the main thing is to recognize that your conflicts are actually lessons that are trying to teach themselves to you. They're a set of skills that you're being asked to learn. Um, they're ways of being in the world that you're being asked to appreciate. And uh, I think that what you will discover as you um, shift from being reactive to um, a kind of more learning orientation where you inquire into what is really going on with the other person, just with whoever it is that you're in conflict, ask this question. Um, what does this mean to you? Why do you feel so deeply about this? Why is this so important to you? Ask those kinds of questions. And, what, and then really listen to what is being said and talk about what is important to you in it and try to get beneath the surface of the conflict. I think that's the solution everywhere, no matter what kind of conflict we're dealing with. The, the conflict is actually an opportunity. It's our, it's our teacher. Exactly right. An opportunity and a journey. Thank you, Ken, and thanks everybody for listening. Be sure to check out the show notes at 10kh.show for more information and you know links and references to what we talked about. Any any follow-up questions, Nate? Ah uh, man, you know, I got so much out of that. I, I love listening to it again uh just now. And um, you know, I, I coming back to this thing that we started off the episode with talking, how, we, how can we apply this internally to our internal conflict? When Ken says it's just a matter of scale, I thought that was brilliant where it's, whether it's a fight with your wife over breakfast or truth and reconciliation in Liberia, um, that is just a matter of scale and these same steps to listening and interest in the other side. And I really latched onto this idea of negotiating for interest, interest-based negotiation. I might be getting the vocabulary wrong, but I, I really thought that was revealing. Now, Ankur, I gotta ask, this was, this was actually something that you, this was a field that you were gonna go into for a while. This is something kind of near and dear to your heart, conflict resolution. Oh, definitely. And it's still, it's still a big part of how I see myself in my work. But, but you're right, a few years ago, when I started getting the courage to dream a little bit bigger and think about, you know, really consciously think about, okay, what is the direction of my life? Like, what is the vision I have? The first thing I came up with was, I wanna be involved in mediating conflict on an international scale. I, I, want, I wanna help put an end. This is why I asked Ken the question about, you know, Israel and Palestine, or I would have asked about India and Pakistan if we had kept going. I want to put an end to these like multi-generational conflicts that, that affect billions of people, which is, you know, it's quite ambitious. And, and I, I'm no longer as focused on that. I no longer have that amount of, I don't know if ambition is the right, the right word, but I'm, I'm, I'm focused on other things at the moment. But during that process, that investigation is when I discovered Ken's, Ken's work. And it just absolutely blew me away because here was someone who was actually doing that. And then to talk to him and see the depth of his humility. And when I asked the, you know, the, the big kind of joking, but kind of serious, the big question about 
you know, peace in the Middle East, in, instead of taking it as a joke or coming back with some theoretical, you know, this is Ken Cloak's prescription or solution to the problem, he actually came out with actual initiatives, you know, events and like community grass level programs that are happening right now that are, in his mind, solving that problem mm -hmm. to, you know, to the best, given the constraints of the zero sum game that he outlined, you know, right. and I, I just thought that was so, so humble and so beautiful and so just so, so aligned with everything else he's saying. So I, I want to turn that question back around on you that you closed the interview with of you asked Ken, what, what advice can you give to someone stepping into this field? But assuming that many of us maybe have these same aspirations, like what's the biggest thing that you could envision and for some, someone it's world peace. For something so epic like that, so large, so kind of bigger than life almost. What's your advice? How can we approach this with our relationships day by day with ourselves? Yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful question. And, you know, I'm in, of course, as we all are, a journey towards understanding about that. But something I've learned from previous guests on this on this show and, and other authors who we haven't yet interviewed, but, you know, I took this training with uh, Jim Detmer and Diana Chapman of the Conscious Leadership Group a few months ago, and that was really impactful. And, you know, there's just a lot of overlap with what Ken is saying and what Uncle Jamal was saying in episode one. The, the idea is if we can't get to awareness and acceptance of our own physical and mental states, if we can't have a high level of understanding of what's going in, on inside and accepting ourselves for how we are and therefore allowing, allowing our experience to be our teacher and to be our catalyst towards growth, rather than trying to reject it or deny it, we have very little hope of positively impacting other people. And so that's a place where we can all start every moment of just, you know, turning the question internally and looking, looking at moments that we perceive as difficult or frustrating or setbacks and seeing them as our greatest teachers and encountering those moments with curiosity and with an open mind. What a fantastic answer. I, you know, halfway through you answering that question, I realized like what a uh, boiling pot of oil I, I threw you into by asking that you, <laughs> you answered it so well. Yeah. So, I mean, essentially it's awareness. Yeah. I think awareness is always the first step. Wonderful. Thank you for this interview and thank you to Ken Cloak and thank you all for listening. We'll see you next time. 